The very act of reading helps us grow in virtue. It cultivates the ability to contemplate so that when we do read God's Word or the Liturgy of the Hours and pray that, we, we have a greater capacity to stay with the words to, to deep read. Marcy Stockman is the founder and president of Well Read Mom, an international movement and book club, and a former nurse practitioner in mental health and homeschool educator. In this episode, she sits down with Dr. Michelle Zaleski, Assistant Professor of English and Writing Center Director at Benedictine College. Listen in as they discuss the encouragement of community among women, her vision of well-read mom, and the power of lifelong reading. Benedictine College is transforming culture in America, one conversation at a time. From our studios in Atchison, Kansas, these are the Benedictine Dialogues. To get us started, I thought you could tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of the vision, where the vision uh, behind Well-Read Mom came. Okay, thanks, Michelle. It's great to be here on Benedictine's campus. I love it. Love being here. So I'm Marcy Stockman, married to Pete for almost 40 years, and seven children, 17 grandchildren. And there was no real vision behind it. It just, it, it came about this way when my daughter, Bess, was a new mom. She called me one day and she said, Mom, I'm, I'm not going back to this mother's group. I've been there three times. They're just talking about their kids. Isn't there somewhere after college where women get together and talk about, you know, the real questions of life? And at that time, I was giving some talks to mothers of preschoolers in northern Minnesota where I live. And each time I gave the talk, I called the talk, I, I actually called the talk Well Read Mom. I wanted to see what women were reading, but the truth is women weren't reading. And so when I drove home from these talks, I'd be sad because I thought, no one is reading quality literature, and I'm not either, like I used to. Um, so when Beth called this day and told me she was sad, she wasn't going back to the, this mother's group because all they were talking about was their kids and um, diapers and and things like that, Our, her need to be with other women in a meaningful way and have real connection merged with my desire that I read, again, quality literature. And so these two needs merged. And that's how this idea for Wowered Mom was born. So it was really an answer to, at the origin, it was a cry for companionship. And so, so that's how it started. Just... It was a proposal to read books, great and worthy books, with my daughter. I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit more, like, why reading? You know, mothers could easily, maybe more easily, get together and talk about, you know, a TV show, the latest TV show they watched, or go, go to the cinema and see a movie. Um, why reading? What is reading kind of to you? Why reading? Well, it, you know, everyone knows reading is important. We, who's going to say, I wish I would have spent more time on social media? Like we, we all intuit, no, it's a better use of my time. It's a better search in life for what really matters to, to read something of value, right? And yet, you know, whenever I talk to people in my own life experience, it's very easy to say, I don't have time to read. And yet we value reading. So... Why, if we, if we value it, why do we say I don't have time? You know, that's sort of a contradiction. If we value something, why, why wouldn't we? So it, it's sort of, um, well, the proposal to read great and worthy books together is, is a chance to, like, allow our values to, to be congruent with what we, to follow that in action. So reading's important because, and I can turn it back to you, Michelle, we could, I know you must value it too. You're in this, right? So it, it opens us up to questions of, of, and we come to see that our hearts are the same. Like we're made for more. We're made for love. We, it, it helps us ask what we're doing here on this earth and grow in our humanity. So reading quality literature is, is a step 
away from living a utilitarian life, you know, where you're just like a robot going through all the things you need to do. It allows us to kind of nurture our person and grow in empathy, see other people's lives and come to understand, oh, they, there's people who really struggle in, in ways I might never struggle, but it's a real struggle and, and a human struggle. And then I, sh I see areas where I really struggle and I grow in those areas. I see it in a new way. So I think reading is so valuable and worth our time. Even when we don't have time. Someone said, how do you find time to read when you don't have time? You know, when you don't have time to read is when you need to read the most probably. For those people who might not know what Well-Read Mom is, could you maybe explain a little bit how it's different than maybe a typical book club? Because um, I think even for me, you know, I, I've encountered many a book club, but I feel like Well-Read Mom is, has kind of a particular um, quality that makes it unique. Well, I, th I think the origin of starting from this cry of the heart for a place of meaningful connection. So right away, you've got a longing for community in a deeper way. You know, because oftentimes a church or in town, you run into someone in the grocery store and it can kind of be small talk or you talk about how busy you are, what your kids are in. But literature gives us a place to come and talk about. You, you know, we might read a book like East of Eden and end up, talking about marriage and, and, a, and no one knew we were going to talk about this angle of marriage, but there's many book lists out there, right? You can, you can see book list after book list online, but well Read Mom's different because of the origin. And it, it's also different because when, when we decided to do this, I said, Beth, let's get together. Let's read great, worthy books, really good books for five years. You get some friends from St. Paul, where you live. She was newly married with Catherine and, and living in a little apartment. I'm up north in Crosby, Minnesota. I'll get some friends in my area. Let's really do this. I'll put together the book list. So I went to my bookshelves. They didn't look like this, but uh, these are amazing. Uh, I, could, I might just stay here, you know, <laughs> just kick back. A anyway, I, I went to my bookshelves at home. I pulled all these books and put them on the rug just like this. I put piles of books on my rug. And, and I thought, okay, I'm going to make a five-year book list. How do I do this? So I had them all setting out. And I thought, how do I organize these books for this five-year book list? Because I had the epics of ancient Greece and Rome and on to St. Augustine's Confessions and, and Adante, you know, and I so I was arranging them that way, chronologically, and then I thought, you know, I have a problem because I don't, I don't really want to be in this book club <laughs> because we read all of these books. We really do, and I think it's, it's great to read them chronologically. But for women, this book club needs to be ordered and structured in a way that fits a woman's life, right? So shorter reads during the, the months of uh, holidays, when there's Christmas or spiritual classic during Advent and Lent, and short stories during, you know, times that are busier. So try, this got to work for a woman's life. So I was just praying about how to start it, how to organize the books. And one day I was reading uh, Pope John Paul's Letter to Women, and which I love. And he was thanking women for their various gifts. Thank you, women who work. Thank you, women who are mothers. Thank you, women who are daughters and sisters and friends. And it just struck me, I, that's it. Let's organize the books according to sort of the capacities or a woman's life. You know, every woman's a daughter. Every woman is a friend. And every woman works. And it's, and it's for all women. Not everyone is married and a biological mother, but ontologically we're, there's that feminine mothering that we're all called, called to. So it's for, for all women, and yeah. It's nice to have, as you mentioned, East of Eden, but then two old women, um, right. which are different commitments, um, but still, as you say, kind of rich, um, 
jumping off points for meaningful discussion with other mothers, uh, with my own mother for two old women. That was right. a, a great um, jumping off point for my own family. Um, I wonder if you could talk maybe a little bit more. Um, I know some of this kind of came out in, in what you were just saying about um, kind of how you try and structure for women um, particular methods of reading or kind of like particular approach to literature. Um, I, this is something I really noticed kind of maybe even implicitly as well as explicitly in, in the well-read ROM materials. But um, how did you kind of develop this approach to literature that has kind of characterized the distinctive nature of well-read mom? And are there any like particular influences besides um, John Paul II? Well, our family, my husband and I, we've been involved in communion and liberation. And Father Giussani often talked about your own experience, learning to see your own experience and, and look at that and look at. So, so that practice was and weekly school of community was, has been helpful. But also just in reading literature, like I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, but I recognize, in fact, I remember when I was, well, I'm gonna go back because after we decided to do this for five years, I was sitting around the table with Beth and Catherine and my other daughter, my daughter-in-law, Steph, and her new baby, and Isaac, and I said, let's really do this. And Steph said, well, if we're going to do this, and Beth was going to invite friends, and I was going to invite friends, she said, if we're going to do something for women, let's, let's make it beautiful. Let's do it in a beautiful way. And I remember just tearing up because I thought, yes, you know, who does something really beautiful for moms? You know, sometimes we're the ones who do everything to make everything beautiful, but something really beautiful for women staying home who are, you know, doing the most important work in the world, arguably, you know, talking, looking in little eyes and wiping noses and helping to nurture a person. What is more important? So let's do something really beautiful. So Steph sat down at my kitchen table and sketched out that silhouette and, and we called it Well Read Mom. And we had a that went on the very first postcard. So I had these 23 postcards inviting 23 or 22 women to my home, and Beth had the postcards. Like we were going to really invite them to something, a clear proposal to discuss great and worthy books from the Western and Catholic tradition. So the proposal was clear, but then I have these postcards. I'm taking them to this blue mailbox on Main Street. I live in a small town with one stop sign on Main Street. You know, and I have these postcards and I, my hand's in the mailbox, my arm is in the mailbox, and I can't drop the postcards because I'm so afraid. You know, all, the, all of a sudden I thought, if, if I drop these postcards, like, these things are going to go out. And this means concretely, <laughs> it, it was such a risk because at that, I remember the moment I thought, but I'm not a scholar. Like, I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I, who do I think I am inviting? I'm going to do these introductions on a book. I'm not an expert. And then I understood that, that I'm a person. And these great books were written for ordinary people like me. We don't need to be, you know, in academia somewhere. Now, we will interview professors. I've interviewed professors here at Benedicted. Uh, Brother Levin writes for us. So, of course, we want people who can help us glean insight. But these books were written for ordinary people, not you know, they're written for people like me, and they help me live. They help me live in a, in a new, way, a fuller life. I see more. I see more when I'm re in the pages of this kind of literature. I see more in my life. So it's, it's, there's a fullness to it. So. Well, and I think too, I mean, you mentioned Brother Levin. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with Well Read Mom, they, um, don't only give you a, a list on a sheet of paper, but they give you a nice reading companion. Um, and that companion is filled with kind of reflections on each of the 
different um, books throughout the year. Um, and I think for me, kind of like you're saying, the, the beauty of those reflections um, and the power of those reflections isn't necessarily coming from the fact that like Brother Levin is a brother or he has some kind of authority, um, but coming from his personal reading experience of the text, right? So, you know, hearing a mother talk about how um, the text makes her think differently about uh, her 15-year-old son, right? And her relationship with that 15-year-old son, right? Like that, that is the power of it, right? That's kind of the authority and where it's coming from. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about kind of the process also of um, kind of not just compiling the, the lists, but um, writing things like the companion and preparing those kinds of materials for um, for for mothers um, as someone who directs the writing center here. Um, I not only believe in the power of reading, but also the power of writing. And so I'm really interested in hearing kind of for you how the process of writing the these materials maybe change your, changes your relationship to the text themselves um, and your understanding okay. of what you've read. Okay, well, I've got to give a shout out to Benedictine College because uh, early on, Susan Severson, who's a graduate of the English Lit program, she has written the bios in our companion since we began. And so kudos to you, Susan. And there's another writer this, this year. Oh, she's writing for next year. Claire, Claire Volk, it's, that's not her married name now. But yeah. So we have a lot of Benedictine writers and, and writers from other, other places. But we are very grateful for the writers. And back to how we look at the literature, we're not necessarily, we're not technical about the literature or analyzing it. We are looking at our experience and we're comparing it with our heart. What's happening in the book and looking at our own life. Does this happen to me? You know, I've had that experience or, or this author is telling me something I know, but I didn't know I knew it. And and it's interesting because when you discover something that's true to the human condition and you recognize that's me, he's talking about me, there's something in that that bonds us. You know, something you have thought you were alone in, kind of, and you recognize it's, a, it's they're an author's explaining it to you. you. You feel part of humanity in a, a deeper way. And I think this is why it aids us in community and building community and growing in the faith together. Since we're talking about the companion, um, can you explain maybe why you guys choose themes for each year and maybe that process, why themes are important to hold the list together? Right. So it started with Pope John Paul's One and Women with kind of themes of womanhood, daughter, worker, mother sister, friend. And we have done some others like Year of the Artist, Year of the Pilgrim. And from Year of the Pilgrim, we started doing pilgrimages to Our Lady of Good Hope, which has been wonderful. And then we did Year of the Family. So I can't tell you what next year's is, but uh, it'll be coming out soon. Uh, so the theme really Year of the Seeker. So we, we look at books that in some way bring out seeking, you know, single-minded seeking like in True Grit or people who are seeking for the wrong thing like in Dracula, you know. So we just look at it from all kinds of angles. And it gives us a focus for the year. I'm kind of interested in the interplay between the theme and then choosing the books um, so you kind of already talked a little bit about how you try and create a schedule that balances out the ebb and flow, the natural ebb and flow of the seasons, um, even the liturgical year. Um, but do you try, are there other kind of factors that go into deciding kind of which books you read um, for a specific theme? Right. So we, you know, what is the canon of great books? Well, we wanted to be a bit broader than a select book list. We wanted to be able to include new authors. So this year we read Karis in the World of Wonders. But it must have a literary quality. It must have a, you know, the prose 
and the beauty of the prose need, needs to be there. And so we've read, we read the autobiography of Miss Jane Pitmel, and to get a sense of history and understand uh, what Jane Pittman lives through in a different way. Or So we wanted to include authors from a, a broader you know, base than, than uh, the, maybe a select list from the Western tradition. There's kind of, there's like a richness there, I think, that I, I feel like I experience when I read. Right. And read yet book. we've read, you know, The Odyssey and, and, and we're, we're returning to Dante in a few years and, and The Aeneid next year. Okay. So now you know one book for next year. Thank you for listening to the Benedictine Dialogues. We'll be right back to the show after this brief message. Greatness does not begin in comfort. Greatness begins in the heart of a storm. Benedictine monks followed an impossible call to leave the old world behind and bring the order of St. Benedict to America. The light of the Virgin Mary led them to a chosen place on the bluffs of the Missouri River. Benedictine sisters answered the call, knowing they would face persecution, guided forward by a light that delivered them to sanctuary. Together, these brave men and women founded Benedictine College, where community, faith, and scholarship light the path. Not away from the storm, but through it. In the 21st century, ravens answer the call. Working together to innovate and inspire, serving Christ in each and every person, committed to a greatness that no challenge can overcome. Ravens, wherever your call may lead, you will weather the storm. You will carry the light. You will transform culture in America. And now, back to the show. So we want to read the great books. Yeah. And, and it's so fun. And I don't know if you've had this, but this year, reading, uh, reading A Severe Mercy, for example, he's referring to Eliot, and he's referring to St. Augustine. And the women in my group, are saying, we're becoming well-read. We, we know what he's talking about. And then there's a greater enjoyment when you can recognize, you know, what he's alluding to, what's being alluded to. So, yeah. Um, so you mentioned carrots. I'm curious, like, how are you just reading all the time? Like, because, you, you know, you're helping to come up with these lists. So especially with new authors, because there are quite a few that I even, you know, I was like, I don't, I haven't heard of this person. Um, right. This is a, a nice surprise. Um, how do you, are you, yeah, kind of, right? Are you just reading? No, I'm, I'm here at Benedictine for one day. I have 10 books in my car. It's, it's ridiculous, oh, really? you know, it's just crazy. But I am reading a lot and I, I'm grateful for that. But we have beta readers. Uh, we have some professors that we ask when we come up with a theme. It's Colleen Hutt and Carla Galdo and myself who are the primary people on the book selection committee. And then we have people we're asking and, and beta reading and at least three of us on the team and then our whole Walred Mom team read the books. So, or at least three of us have read the, each book. So it, we've, we're learning to like take the curating of the book list seriously because this is a gift to offer a well thoughtful curated book list that we that that women can say even if they don't like it or are scandalized by a book that they can say no they this wasn't just pulled out of thin air they this was thoughtfully done and there's a reason and and we've added that section in the companion that talks about a closer look which Carla does a wonderful job and that goes through why we chose this book with the theme and things you might look for. It's kind of fun to hear how, yeah, all the, all the work that goes into it that you don't 
We've some of it you, of course, tell us about, but. Well, and now we have to be three years ahead just because we have to call Penguin and Harper and say, hey, we're going to need thousands of this book. So, and, you know, if they, they're starting to, to see that, that that's really true, that there is something going on here and the book will sell. And so it, it takes uh, about three years. We have to be ahead of it, the schedule. And, but that's a great, great situation because I know the goal here or one of the vision of Benedictine College is transforming culture. And, and you guys are doing it well here through your liberal arts curriculum. And I'm so grateful to be able to say that and support Benedictine College. And but that's our vision too, transforming culture. And we're doing it through little groups of women all over the country. You know, now there's over a thousand groups, uh, about 10,000 women all over the country and in other countries reading these books, and we're reading them at the same time. So you can't do the first years, you know, maybe in the summer you can and that kind of thing, but we ask people to stay together. And that's for transforming culture. These little sprouts, these little groups of people, kind of like yeast, you know, activating the human heart where we say, the Lord is present in everything, you know? You start to, it starts to be activated and stirred up as our humanity grows, that the Lord is at work everywhere in every part of life. And, and I think that this is part of cultural renewal. Also, because we're reading the same books at the same time, you can talk to your mom, maybe, who's in a group, and or your sister-in-law or a friend, and you can talk about Karis in the World of Wonder or East of Eden or Brideshead. And all of a sudden, you're having a dialogue. Like, I was in the airport, and I saw a woman reading one of our books, right? And I thought, that's a well-read mom book, you know? So I go over there. I walk over in the airport. I said, you know, I'm reading that book, too. And, I, and she said, oh, uh-huh. And... She, I said, are, are you, she said, I'm reading it from my book club. I said, oh, yeah. I said, does your book club have a name? You know, and she said, it, it's Well Read Mom. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've heard of it. It's taking over my life. <laughs> Just kidding. So, but we were able to then have a conversation about that book and discuss something meaningful in the airport because there was a, uh, reading the same book at the same time creates a space for dialogue and a core, a core base. Really beautiful. Um, I, I'm wondering, just kind of picking up on that idea of transforming culture, um, if you have kind of any advice based on your own experience and your own story for people who, you know, feel this real call to transform culture. Um, and to, you know, put their faith into action. Um, where can they start with that? Like where, I mean, just based on kind of your, your story of well-read mom and this, yeah, this beautiful gift that, um, we've been given with it, you know, where, how, how do you, how do you do that? Right. How do we do it? I don't know. We're, it's the new evangelization, right? I think the new evangelization will come through friendship, through small groups of friendship, at least in the broader world. I know it's lived so well on campus here at Benedictine, the hospitality and the, the friendships that form. And, um, and I know that also goes out into the greater culture, and I've seen it. So that's friendship. Father Dasani said to someone, everything good happens through friendship, and I really think it's true. Uh, so many women are lonely and need, want deeper relationships. And just on the car ride here, my husband and a friend sent me a, a witness of a Lutheran pastor who became Catholic, and he's telling his story. And then toward the end of this, he says that his wife's journey into the church came in a different way, and she joined this Warred Mom group. And all of a sudden, she's with women who... It's like their, their uh, life with Christ. She, she meets these women and sees, it's not just Sunday over here going to 
church. It's it's part of their life. Like they want to share the Lord with their children. They care about, you know, they're, it's every part of their life. And and that was her journey into the church, like complementing his journey, uh, you know, reading the church fathers. But but we are seeing this now more and more, like people coming into the church, people meeting Christ, people growing stronger in their faith through these little groups of friendship. Now, I remember a time in my life when I was in graduate school on biblical studies because I thought, Lord, I want to like give everything to you. And, you know, it seemed to me like a, a degree in theology, a master's degree in theology would be the way to do it because I'd learn more about the Lord's word and, and the church. And the problem was I really wasn't good at it. I, like I said, I'm not an academic in that way. And I, I, it was so hard and it was, I couldn't write these papers and all of this. And a friend of mine said, well, what, what is it you love? And I said, well, I love literature. It helps me live. But what does that have to do with, you know, evangelization? And she said, she said, you need to follow that desire follow that desire for what you love and what helps you live and it will and so I quit graduate school and which was you know there were other reasons but that was the main reason and if I wouldn't have I don't know that Walford Mom would have started and I took a risk on literature and I can't tell you when so when we were driving here and we're listening to this Lutheran pastor and he started talking about his wife and how that was part of her journey into the church like Pete he grabbed my hand and he squeezed it and he, he had tears going down and he understands too together, you know, that, that this work has something to do with transforming culture. So it seems like a small thing, little, little groups of women reading, you know, brides had revisited. Yeah. How is that going to change anything? And yet it's, it's, it's like yeast. When our humanity is engaged and activated, it's like yeast, right? And we, we get in the game in a new way. You know what? You can sit on the bench at a basketball game and, and be a player on the team, but when you get in the game, you know, and it's 84-84 with one minute to go, you know, you're engaged in, in your life in that moment in a different way. And I think literature helps us to get in the game in a new way. It's kind of a question that no one else can answer for you. You know, you have to follow your own needs, your own desire. But like, given what you've just said, that's so clearly kind of what you did. And then it just grows and blossoms in ways that, yeah, you yeah. don't even necessarily expect but that's something that I try and talk to my uh, first year writing students about when they're trying to come up with paper topics you know it's like you know I can't I can't answer this question for you you need to think about you know what is it that your heart desires what is it that you want to explore you want to learn right right questions are good was it Nyberg who said uh he said I'm, I'm quoting this wrong probably, but nothing is more absurd than giving an answer to a question that hasn't been asked. So it's important that we have questions, uh, that questions are opened up within us. And, and then you go on a search, you know, and, and then you, you grow and learn. And, it's, you know, it's part of our maturing. Okay, I have kind of like three questions for you, I think, and then we can like call it a day. Um, one of them is a selfish question, and then one of them is a question from curiosity. And then one of them is kind of, I feel like I should ask this question, be, but um, you have like so beautifully just um, naturally kind of answered all my questions that are about kind of tying back to Benedictine um, and, and stuff. But I feel like I should give you just one last kind of opportunity to talk about kind of the ways in which um, you see well-read mom um, connecting back to your kind of Catholic faith, either, you know, ways in which you, 
your faith has shaped while we're mom, or even kind of conversely, like ways in which it's kind of brought life back to your relationship with Christ? Sitting down with the book, first of all, giving yourself permission to sit down with one of these big, hefty, hefty books in the middle of the day and sit for an hour and read, which arguably we could all say could be considered in our day and age a waste of time. Do you know what I mean? Really, you're going to read Plato or in your free, or you're going to read this novel, True Grit. It's not religious. Why wouldn't you read the Bible? Why wouldn't you pray more, right? But the very act of reading helps us grow in virtue. The very act of reading, we, we have to slow down. and We have to focus our attention, which is not a small thing. And focusing our attention, slowing down to comprehend, helps us in our relationship with the Lord because we're contemplating. We, it cultivates the ability to contemplate so that when we do read God's Word or the Liturgy of the Hours and pray that, we, we have a greater capacity to stay with the words, to, to deep read, to read them in a way that unleashes, our, unleashes more. So the very act of reading, it, it's not against, it's, it's not like, should I read a novel or should I read the Bible? Hopefully we're reading and praying with scripture every day. But literature doesn't go against, or yeah, it doesn't go against that. It, it actually helps cultivate those virtues that can lend themselves to, for me to pay more attention at mass, you know, which is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, yeah, kind of like a form of contemplation prayer that, as you're saying, in right. our modern society is really, is kind of a lost art, becoming a lost art, but hopefully not with well Rebound. Right. And I think everyone's different because my husband will listen to music and he'll come home from work and sit and listen to music and it just fills his soul. So I, I think the arts, you know, looking at great works of art or listening to music or reading a great book, they it's been a it's been it's been something maybe we've missed out on as as the liberal arts have been cut more in our society in favor of, you know, other fields. But we need this. We need this to you'll be a better doctor if you give yourself this time to cultivate because not only will you work in the science of medicine, but you'll work in the art of medicine in relating to the person. So I think you'll be a better mother if you take time to cultivate through the arts. The arts are a link to, to the Lord, you know, and they're, they're a, a starting point for, for dialogue with others who, like, for example, you don't have to be, uh, I'll tell you two stories. So one woman came uh, to a group and she, she was a postal worker. And so this woman for, in Maward Mom met her and they got to talking about books. She was sending a book to someone and, and the postal worker said, well, I like to read and I like to read this kind of books too. And she said, well, you should come to my group. So the woman comes to her group. All right. So after about five months, she said, she said, wait a minute. She said, are, are you Catholic? And, and she, the woman said, yes. You know, and, she, and she said, are you Catholic? Are you? And you? So she goes around. She goes, so everyone here is Catholic. And then she said, because I hate Catholics. And I like all of you. And five years ago now, uh, at Easter Vigil, she came into the church. So there you go, transforming culture through friendship. And an, a, another story, we just read Dracula this month. Strange book, very strange. I can't say it was my favorite. It was not my favorite, okay? I would, you know, we fight for these books on the book list and, and some of them are a little scary for me to put, in, put out there and I, I have to say no. 
it's a great book. There's a reason, and I've got to be open to, can't just always play it safe, you know? So anyway, we put Dracula there, and so my daughter, Beth, she's, she's having Wild Mom in her house, and they're discussing Dracula, and she's at the grocery store getting some snacks, and she runs into her old neighbor who was an atheist, and it's Halloween time, and they're and her neighbor, her old neighbor said, oh, I just finished Dracula. And Beth said, you're kidding. You know, we're reading Dracula for my Wild Mom group, and we're discussing it tonight. Do you, do you want to come? And she says, okay. So she comes to Beth's house. Now, they end up having a discussion on the Eucharist because there's hosts in the, yeah. you know, and, and on the sacramentals and the crucifix and what is evil and what what is it for evil to come into your home and what is that about and so they have this fascinating discussion that night with a woman who is not a believer on the eucharist and they and she said you mean you really believe this is the body and blood of god and they said we do now, I, I don't know what will come for that, but isn't it interesting that something like that, that kind of dialogue and discussion can happen from a willingness to say, come on in. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. I also will just say my Dracula story, um, for what it's worth, is I love that time period of literature. Some of my favorite novels are, are from that time period, but I always was like, I, I don't know. I did not like the idea of reading Dracula. I think just because it was about vampires, I guess. And so I'd never read it. Um, and I, again, some of the beauties of well Read Mom, I think, are the ways in which it reflects the Catholic tradition. And, you know, there's a proposal. Read Dracula. I'm called to listen or follow. And, and that's what I did, despite my, I don't know, better judgment or my own uh, inclinations. And I, yeah, that book was such a gift and such a surprise in so many ways. And I had so many conversations with people, yeah, that I were outside of Well-Read Mom that I just wouldn't have had if I had not read that book. And it just, it felt, it was such a, a, a lovely surprise because again, I didn't, I would have never read that book had it not been on the right. Well-Read Mom list. Right. And also if a book really makes you uncomfortable for whatever reason, by all means, don't read it. You know, I mean, we're adults, right? So... People, people decide, and, but sometimes it just takes a bit of pushing through, and then you... I, th I think that book, like the first 50 pages are some of the best pages, like so intriguing, so exciting of literature that I've, I've read in a really long time. So, okay, two more questions, and we'll be out of here. Um, so my second to last question, this is a selfish question, um, is... I often ask my students in our writing classes to reflect on reading because I think you really can't think of yourself without, you can't think of yourself as a writer without thinking of yourself as a reader. Those, the two things are, there's a relationship between the two. Um, and so I encourage them to tell me kind of their literacy journey or their literacy narrative. Um, either by kind of going from the beginning to the end, or, you know, I learned to read from my mother uh, on our couch to I'm in college now, um, or just picking out kind of defi a defining moment from their life where they really feel like their relationship to reading changed. Um, so I was just curious to hear a little bit about what reading has meant to you in your life and if there are any kind of defining moments or um, things that pop out as kind of your story of what it means to be a reader or to read? I was, I was really blessed to, I went to a Catholic school and I had the same teacher for sixth grade and seventh grade, Mrs. Alms. And she read out loud to us every day for an hour. If, if we were behaving <laughs> and getting our work done. And we sat on the edge of our seats. And I remember she had all these pencils in her hair, which I can relate to because I usually have a few pair of glasses on my head. And she, she, she wanted to give us something beautiful. And I saw that in Mrs. Alms. I've gone back and thanked her for that uh, 
10 years ago, I was able to see her at a luncheon and, and give her a big hug and thank her for reading to us and seeing, because we came alive and we understood there's something in there, because oftentimes we become school time readers and you go through the whole school system and you sort of read less and less. And now with all that's available online and ways to find things, you you often don't just lose yourself in a, in a book in the same way. So when children are read to, when I was read to, that was an aha moment that something is in there that I want more of. And it started me on a path. So I'm, hats off to good teachers who who read to their class. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think, yeah, like you're saying, I think we we forget that reading is social. Uh, that's one thing we, I talk about in my upper level classes. Literacy is a social. It, we become better readers through socialization. You know, we learn to read from people. But I think oftentimes both reading and writing are pictured as these solitary acts where we're kind of as a writer inspired by the the muses or something like that, um, or as a reader, we're just using reading to kind of escape from the world. And I think, you know, that can be true, definitely. But um, I think we come alive as readers and we grow as readers and we grow as writers um, in community, right? Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so I feel like that story is a really beautiful reflection of that belief that I have about, about reading and writing. My last question, okay, <laughs> you come out of here, uh, is um, what have been your favorite books from all the well Mom books? You know, if you had like a top three or top or, three or more or less, oh, yeah. you know, but oh. what are those favorite, top favorite three. books? And I, they can be totally your own personal, you know, right. it has nothing to do with yeah, these yeah. are the best books for all the women out there, it can just be a selfish, right. this was my favorite thing that I, I've read or done. Um, well, you know, the, at the origin, when I recognized that I wasn't reading at the origin, like, wow, reading good literature has fallen by the wayside for me. And I'm going around speaking to mothers of preschoolers on calling it well-read mom, you know, out of my own desire to get back to it and wanting to encourage women to read. Um, I recognized when Beth called that day with that desire for meaningful connection, I recognized that I wanted to give her the experience of these great books that I had read in the past. I wanted her to share that with her. So I wanted her to read Kristen Lavenstander by Singrid Unset, a great woman's novel that Unset has the courage to take Kristen from age seven to her death. That's courageous. And Unset converts to Catholicism while she's, while she's writing. This is a great epic novel. Uh, it's that along with Tolstoy. I wanted to share Anna Karenina. I want us to read War and Peace down the line. These are, we read Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, you know, thousand page novel. And, and I took it off the list. And I said, this is too much. We've been reading too. This is, this is hard. I mean, next year, we have, a, we have quite a lineup next year. And it's, it's intimidating. But I, when I took Les Mis off the list, and then Beth called me. She says, Mom, where's Les Mis? I don't see it on here. Uh, this was for the Year of the Pilgrim, I believe. And I said, oh, honey, you know, I just thought it was too much because we have this and we have that. And she said, Mom, you are lowering the bar. Mom. She said, we cannot do that. She said, we agreed to raise the bar. And if I don't read Les Miserables with this group of friends, I will, when will I read it? When? When will I read it? And it went back on the list. And it ended up being, you know, one of my favorite books. It's beautiful. We, we have another Victor Hugo one on the list for two years from now. So, yeah, more Hugo coming. And... So Les Mis, Anna Karenina, A Death of Ivan Illich, a short story by Tolstoy. Uh, more Tolstoy coming, more Dostoevsky coming. Um, we just read T.S. Eliot, and Dr. Aaron Riches did an amazing interview on it that's one of my favorites. Uh, 
I'd, I'd never experienced T.S. Eliot before. So I'm so, so grateful that I'm being pushed to go deeper and in these great, great works. And so, yeah, Kristen Lavin's daughter. Also, Giants in the Earth. Have you read that? Mm -mm. By Rolvig. So I, I, hopefully we can bring that one back. It's a great American epic as well. Uh, Giants in the Earth. So, and also Willa Cather. She's one of my favorites. It's nice to hear that because, you know, like you say, some women may have just started reading this last year, so they haven't gotten to read all of them. Anyone who wants, please join us um, at uh, go to wellreadmom.com, info at wellreadmom, look for a group or we'll email us. We'll help you find a group. We'd love to have you join us. And, and if you don't feel you're a reader, you know, just join in and one day you, you will be. So hundreds and hundreds of women are experiencing great and worthy books. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that, I mean, in my experience, you know, if you find yourself not able to finish East of Eden by January 13th or whatever it is, you know, um, you can down the line finish it. And then you still have opportunities to have all those great conversations. I think, yeah, there's a, a beauty because I love that um, you guys haven't backed down from the big books um, because there is a real sense of accomplishment. There really when is. When you do finish them. Right. Um, that I think, yeah, as a, as a mother who doesn't have a ton of free time um, is oh, really um, powerful in, in small ways. Michelle, can I just say we have one rule in Wild Mom, and it's if you don't get the book read, don't apologize. You know, your vocation is your priority, and sometimes reality shows you you've got to be attending to this or to that. And But having said that, I think uh, if we're creative, we can also find ways to work reading in and read more than we thought we could. And so uh, I hope that people from Benedictine College will continue to join in and continue not just from here at the college, but all the alumni to continue in this journey to be a part of this transformation of culture. Yeah. Well, I, I also just want to say in response to that too, I've seen, like you said, you don't have to be a mom to be in well read mom or to start a well read mom group. And um, I know people who've like recently graduated and, you know, maybe you were an English major, maybe you were uh, an R major, um, but you are kind of like, what do I do now that I don't have teachers telling me what to do for right. in my free time? Oh, yeah. Um, well, our mom can be such a beautiful and nice um, proposal and kind of transition from um, that life of student to, you know, whatever it is you're doing after the um, after school. So um, you don't have to be you can start your own group, right? right. You can we join have, a group or you can start a group. We have single women leading groups, like like you said, young adults. We, we've even had some groups in college that read like four books a year. Uh, but yeah, and the, I, I, I said the oldest member was 87 and we, we received an email from Iowa. No, no, Rosie is 93 and she's in our group and it's with young moms and middle-aged moms and old empty nesters. And so it, it covers the whole timeline. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We hope you enjoyed the Benedictine Dialogues, a production of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. To catch all the latest and support our growing platform, visit media.benedictine.edu. And be sure to recommend this show to your friends and family. Help us to transform culture in America, one conversation at a time.